The word pride appears 46 times in the KJV Bible. And it is translated with 10 different words. However, all these words, they convey essentially the same thing. And that is self-importance. 10 ways to look at self-importance. The Bible does not deny or discourage belief in people's importance. People can be important. Christ thought so. He wouldn't have come and died for them. And your life is important for service to him. But it does denounce all inflating of self-importance. 1 Timothy 3, 6, Paul tells Timothy not to promote a newly converted and inexperienced man to a position of spiritual leadership. And for good reason. Because being a novice, he will be puffed up with pride. As he said, not a novice. That's being lifted up with pride. He fall into the condemnation of the devil. You know, the Greek word pride there means to envelop with smoke. And you know the old saying, where there's smoke, there's fire. And I assure you that wherever you find the smoke of conceit, you will find the fire of pride. And that fire consumes humility, and it conflates the ego. I like what it says about love in 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Charity, or love, is not puffed up. It does not inflate the ego. It deflates it and inflates other people as being important. Isn't that neat how love does that? Deflates the one, inflates the other. We are to think more of others than our own selves. Pride, though, can be illustrated by puffer fish. You know those fish in the water that they can blow themselves up into a big round ball? I'm told there are 120 different kinds of puffers out there in the ocean. 120. Some are just two inches long. Some are two feet in length. But they all do the same thing. They get much bigger. They trick their enemies into thinking that they are too big to attack. And that's just like pride. Pride makes puffer people who blow themselves up with inflated egos, trying to be bigger than they really are. And to such overinflated puffers comes this warning in Galatians 6.3. For if a man thinketh himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. And so we need to come back to our true size. Amen? But many Christians, they simply puff themselves up every time they get around somebody. Not only can people become proud by inflation, they can become proud by association. A flea was riding on the back of an elephant as they were crossing an old bridge. And after they got across, the flea said to the elephant, Did you notice how we shook that bridge? <laughs> there are many saints with the weight of a flea on the back of a spiritual giant. And because they're always associating with the spiritual giant, they think they're a giant too. And because the spiritual giant, when he treads the earth, he shakes the world. And because the flea is with the elephant, he thinks, Woo, we surely shook things up with that revival. Woo, we sure shook things up with that prayer. Man, did you see how we shook things up with that ministry? Actually, you were more just a watcher, not a worker. And so it's really true that by association with greater Christians, we somehow think that we have a greater influence and weight than we really do. Be careful about that. I believe there are more fleas than elephants, don't you? There are more fleas in this world than elephants, and there are more common, ordinary Christians than great ones. Only great Christians shake the world. Pride by association even extends to things we own. I just cannot believe how proud we are of what we own. Things become status symbols. We're proud of our clothing, our cars, our jewelry, our houses, our bank accounts, our possessions. We're proud of our hobbies and interests. You remember Nebuchadnezzar? I want you to remember this greatest king of Old Testament times. 
Of course, that colossal statue that he saw in that dream, that was him. He was the head. He was not at the bottom. He was at the top. And according to Daniel chapter 4, verse number 30, his heart of pride got the best of him. Open up there, Daniel chapter 4, verse number 30, while you're getting there. You remember the dream that predicted his temporary fall for, through pride? Also, that he would be restored after he was humbled? I see him standing on his balcony overseeing the breathtaking view of Babylon. And then he spake these words recorded in Daniel 4.30. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? He barely got those words out of his mouth and God struck him with temporary dementia. And he had to go into hiding until God had restored him after seven years of humiliation. Verse 30 reveals the three hinges that opened the door to pride in the king's heart. Notice it. House of the kingdom, might of my power, and honor of my majesty. Those three phrases correspond to the material, the physical, and the psychological. Those are the three hinges on the door of pride. His egomaniacal pride was associated with those three things. You can look at it like three steps that lead to pride. Take those words, house, might, and honor, as three steps that we all take in pride. Now, the house refers, to, of course, to his spacious, luxurious palace. Also to his many temples that were covered in gold and precious diamonds and all kinds of beautiful carvings, all, again, explicitly, extravagantly done. And then we have the fortress walls, which were the largest in the then known world. And then we have the hanging gardens, which are one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. All of this he took great pride in. His entire city was his showcase, a monument to his pride. And then there was the might. That refers to his authoritarian rule. You know, Nebuchadnezzar was not some smooth negotiator. You know, if you angered him, he would immediately have you arrested. If he didn't like you, he would have your head cut off. With a wave of the hand, lives were ended, and he didn't really care. His temper was a bomb with a short fuse. As I said before, here was a man whose might could not be blocked. His conscience was his only protector, and he had hardened his heart. The honor, of course, refers to Nebuchadnezzar's desire to feel important. I believe that Nebuchadnezzar was a credit junkie. A credit junkie. He wanted to be the one to get the credit. He wanted to take credit for everything that was great and successful. I do believe the real truth comes out in those words that he spoke, the honor of my majesty. Nebuchadnezzar wasn't really trying to glorify his gods. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He constructed the sacred procession way. Have you heard of that, the sacred procession way? The road that he built to the main temple, Markuk. And it was flanked with 120 lions. It also, the road was enameled brickwork dep depicting 575 dragons and bulls. And it was almost a mile long. But the truth be known, it was more or less a monument to his ego. Of course, he was saying, oh, we're trying to honor our gods, Markuk and Nabus, and all our other pagan deities. But really, to be honest, he was doting on himself. Look what I built. He was lavishing praise upon himself. Ladies and gentlemen, we fool nobody. Usually our neighbor, our friend, can see right through it. All this is recorded in Daniel chapter 4 to remind us that we can take the same exact tragic steps with our little less than an acre home. Now, it's your palace. Not much to it. But you know what? You have a little power. Why, you may have 
enough power to control a dog and a cat and a few subordinates at work and maybe some kids, you know, and you also have some honor. Oh, yeah, you can, uh, you can brag on yourself and say, look what I accomplished, and really it's not that much. So we have our little kingdoms. We have our little power. We have our little accomplishments. And if we're not careful, we who could not get our name in the back of the paper in fine print will somehow think that we are God's gift to humanity. Beware. You know, we can behave like chickens in a hen house. You know, when the chickens lay an egg, they start clucking. Like, look what I did! And they start clucking and getting all excited with their chatter as if no one had ever seen such a thing. So far, we touched upon some important truths, hadn't we, about pride. Now, in the remaining time, I want to expose pride. Now, that takes boldness. You know, uh, it's much easier, of course, to excuse pride. Excuse it. But I don't want to excuse it. I want to expose it so that we can take a stand against it. I don't want our church to be a victim of pride. Now, think about this. If I had a choice for you, you could be healthy, wealthy, and smart. Now, I'd want that for you. I really would. Not if you would become proud. I'd rather have you poor, sick, and uneducated, but a humble depender on God. You see, pride really is the worst thing that could ever happen to you. Do you know that pride is the basic sin? Pride's the basic sin on which all other sins are built. Did you know that pride's the first sin by the first sinner? It was pride in Satan's heart that is the origin of evil. You've heard it said, and it's still true. The three R's represent the basic education, reading, writing, arithmetic. All other careers basically need those as a foundation. The same thing is true with any kind of career of sin. The basis of that sin can be found in 1 John 2.16. The three R's of sin. And here it is. For all that is in the world... The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. There it is, the threefold foundation of all sin. No matter how myriad, no matter how complex, no matter how diverse, there it is. I explain it this way. We exploit the appetites of our flesh. Secondly, we explore the world with our eyes. And third, we express vanity with our pride. That's the three things we do to sin. You remember Eve in the Garden of Eden? She did that. She had a physical appetite, which she exploited at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then she went a step further, didn't she? She was told that that tree would make her uh, wise like God, so appealed to her pride. And she explored the tree. She looked at all the fruit on all the branches, there it was. We see that she was exploring, which also led to her appetite to exploit through exploring, and it's not long. We see she took the final step. Pharaoh of Egypt did the same thing. He exploited his lust, which was for agriculture and architecture. And he built Pharaoh's cities on the backs of the children of Israel. He also, of course, was um, exploring. And so he got ideas from all over the world, and I believe he was exploring how he could express his fantasies. And so they built amulets, and they built things that Israel would never want to have for themselves, but they were forced to build carvings and temples and statues and amulets. And then we have the Pharaoh doing the worst thing of all, and through pride, he attempted genocide of the Hebrew male babies. It was his pride that made him do that. It was his pride that made forced labor upon Israel. It was his pride that resisted God's people to let them go. Remember, let my people go. In pride, he said no. That's what Solomon did after he backslid from God. 
you know, he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, which means that he was bankrolling all his fantasies. He had the money. He had the peace. And so he did the same three things. But even though he was doing the exploiting of his flesh and the exploring of the world and the expressing of his vanity, we see that pride was his downfall. The most significant thing about 1 John 2.16 is that it takes these three sins to have the stool stand. Did you know that if you could get rid of your pride, you will see to it that you will never be guilty of the other two? Have you noticed that humble people don't really lose control of their flesh? I find it interesting that wherever you see sin, you'll find the three legs of the stool. You take one leg away and the, and the stool stumbles. I believe the principal leg is pride. It's so hard to sin when you're humble. And so we understand that humble people, they do not feel like being a flamboyant, outrageous, or even secretive sinner. Pride is what drives people to do those things. So not only is pride basic to all the other sins, it's also the biggest one. How big is pride? Go to Proverbs chapter 6 and look at verses 16 and 17. How big is pride? Here it is. These six things doth the Lord hate. Okay, God's got a short list. He says, now I'm going to give you out of all the possibilities, six big ones. Here are six big ones. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. It's like number seven just really ticks me off. Number seven is a great provocation. But what heads the list? A proud look. Now, I want you to think about this. These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are abomination on him, a proud look. What? That's first? Over verbal lying? Over physical violence? Over plotting conspiracies? Over getting into mischief? over false testifying, over dividing the brethren? You're going to put that first? You mean to tell me that body language, the way you make a facial expression? Yes! The face mirrors the heart. God says, you know what? Pride is basically a peacock strutting his feathers. And that's the most obnoxious of all. Pride is big enough to make God's short list of seven abominable sins and I really do believe that it opens the door so that we have abomination after abomination. You could say those other ones if you want. Pride softens us up to do things we would never dream we'd ever do. Go to Hosea chapter 7, verse number 10. How big is pride? Hosea 7, 10. Now, when you read Hosea chapter 7, uh, you see the society is in moral meltdown. I mean, they're in moral meltdown. We have dishonesty everywhere, addictions are rampant, debilitating sins are consuming the health and wealth of the general population. And yet with nothing to be proud of, Israel is proud of their lifestyle. They're proud of it, even though it is ruining them. So here's what it says. And the pride of Israel testifieth to his face, and they do not return to the Lord their God, nor seek him for all this. Did you know that if you have problems in your life and you will open your Bible or go to church, that means that pride has not finally conquered you yet. As long as you'll seek the Lord when you have problems, that's a very good sign because pride hardens the heart. And eventually you reach a point where you can have all hell breaking loose, yet you won't return to the Lord. Pride eventually makes one's heart as hard as granite, only to have it broken, though, with God's hammer. You say, God breaks pride? God has promised to break it. Take a look at this, Proverbs 29.1. He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. God says, I promise you, your pride goes on long enough and gets hard enough, and your neck gets stiff enough, I'll break it sooner or later, and maybe sooner than later. Finally, there is a pride is a big sin because it really unleashes an army of sins. How many of you remember the story 
of how Troy was conquered by the Greeks. You remember they built a huge wooden horse and they hid some of their soldiers inside. They parked that thing just outside the city of Troy as a gift. And the Trojans, they thought that this not only was a surrender, but also was a token of protection for, from their gods. So they opened their gates and they pulled the horse inside. That evening, the Trojans celebrated as the victor. And then they got drunk and they fell asleep. Later that night, the warriors crept out of the hiding place in the horse. They opened the city gates for reinforcements. And in the ensuing battle, Troy was burned and almost all Trojans were killed. The city never had a chance. And that's what pride is. Pride is the Trojan horse that is also hollow on the inside where other sins are sneakily hiding. And when we let pride in, guess what? When we are least expecting it, when we are off our guard, out come the littler sins that open the gates to the bigger sins. And we just get overrun. And where did it all start? With the Trojan horse of pride. Take a look at Ezekiel 16, 49. I love this verse for this very point. Ezekiel 16, 49. Everybody knows that Sodom and Gomorrah were guilty of sin of homosexuality. But that didn't even show up here. Here's what it says in Ezekiel 16, 49. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride. That's the first thing mentioned. Fullness of bread and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. Homosexuality came later. The first step on the slippery slope for Sodom was pride. Pride. Even though they developed a long catalog of sins, at the very top of the catalog of sins was pride. Amazing. Pride was their Trojan horse. And out of its vast bowels came all kinds of sins like idleness and also sexual perversion. I do believe that these other sins will massacre our morals, but pride got them through the door. And I do believe that Satan tempts us with pride just like he tempted, like Troy got tempted with the Trojan horse. And so we think, well, this is truly a monument. They see my greatness. And so we're told, of course, that in the story, they were completely deceived about the purpose of the gift. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul says, now you got somebody who's guilty of a terrible, terrible sin. And yet I want to warn you, that Satan's got another sin waiting after this one. So he says in 2 Corinthians 2.11, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices, there's Satan's Trojan horse. He says, now if you let this one sin in your church, then Satan has turned it into a device which will let loose other sins. By the way, that was unforgiving spirit. He said, if you let in an unforgiving spirit in your church, won't be long, you'll have other sins that will be opened up in your church. I do believe that unforgiving sin is a Trojan horse, like pride is a Trojan horse. It's always attractive to our personal superiority. I think the Trojans thought, yes, this is a picture of us, our superiority. Look how big this thing is. Look how well made it is. That's just like us. And so we are rolling into our hearts, the Trojan horse, thinking that this is an indication of our superiority. It is not. It's an indication you're inferior. If you think you're somebody, you're inferior. And so remember, the Trojan horse problem is also an indication that you don't understand the wiles of the enemy. Now, I want you to think about James 4.10. On the flip side of pride is humility. And as God makes a guarantee about pride, pride he makes a guarantee about humility. Let's look at God's positive guarantee. I love this. James 4.10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. That's a guarantee. If you humble yourselves, God says, I guarantee it. I'll lift you up. 
Now, you won't know when it's going to happen, but I'll do it. And he'll lift us up over the proud people, which are really the inferior people. The proud people are inferior. The humble people are superior. You know, we have this notion in our head that the proud people are the winners, and winners take all. You heard in Psalm 73 that we see the winners are healthy and the winners are rich and winners take all. Yeah, in the short run, but in the long run, the proud people lose everything, even their soul. But the humble, they win in the long run. Did you know that? Would you look at Matthew 5.5 5, where Jesus says, the winners are the humble people. Here's what it says. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Amazing. All humble people get to inherit the earth. We don't lose anything. We may get it postponed, but we're going to get it later because we get to inherit the earth. All the meek, all the humble, they lose in the short run and gain everything in the long run. And God says, I guarantee it. Knowing what God says, which guarantee do you want? And that's why humility is such a big virtue and pride is such a big vice. Now be close with this, number three. Pride is a blinding sin. It's a basic one, and it's a big one, but it's also a blinding one. Pride blinds. First, pride blinds us from recognizing itself. You don't ever recognize pride in yourself. I think it's so amazing, and it's true of human nature. We recognize everybody else's pride but our own. Listen to this. C.S. Lewis made this observation in his classic work called Mere Christianity. This is one of the best things he ever said in that book. I quote, There is one vice of which no man in the world is free, which everyone in the world loathes when he sees it in someone else, and of which hardly any people ever imagine they are guilty of it themselves. I do not think I've ever heard anyone who was not a Christian accuse himself of this vice. There is no fault which we are more unconscious of in ourselves. And the more we have it in ourselves, the more we dislike it in others. Ooh, that stung. Think about that. We have no trouble recognizing pride in others, but we have lots of trouble recognizing our own. You know what I think? I think humility starts the moment you detect your own pride and not a moment before. The moment you detect your pride, humility starts. Second, pride blinds us from the consequences of our sin. Remember Proverbs 16, 18? I want you to look at this verse with me. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Underline those two words, before, before. Before. It really will happen. Before means it's coming. If you're proud, it's coming. It's like you standing on a shoreline, and you see a tsunami coming at you. You say, ah, oh, that'll never get here. It's coming. Yes, it will. And so we got to be aware that the Lord says it's coming. And so pride comes before destruction. You can't get rid of the consequences. You just got to get rid of the cause of the consequences. Now that takes us to Psalm 73, 5 and 6. And this is where Brian read a moment ago. Look at Psalm 73, 5 and 6, words of Asaph. Notice what it says in Psalm 73, 5 and 6. It says about the wicked rich, they are not in trouble as other, as other men. Neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore... Pride compasseth them about as a chain. You know, pride blinds people to the possibility of getting into sudden, unexpected trouble. You know, it's like they are living and acting as if their life is saying, not ever. It's not ever going to happen. It just means this. It's not happening now. No, it will happen Someday you'll lose your health. You may lose your job. You may lose your friends. You don't, you just, don't ever live like, like your life is saying, not ever. It will not ever happen. Every time I do a funeral, I try to impress people that your turn's coming. 
But I look into people's faces, and it's always the same look. No, I'm not ever going to die. Not now, but you can't say not ever. And then the Lord says, if I see pride, here's what I'm going to do. Verses 18 and 19. Surely thou hast set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation? As in a moment they are utterly consumed with terrors. Wow. That's exactly what David said in Psalm 30, verse 6. He said, my mountain stood strong. And all of a sudden it started shaking to pieces. He said it just happened all of a sudden, like an earthquake. Well, I think these are great reminders that we are blinded to the consequences of sin and blinded to the judge who brings judgment on our sin. Now let's think about our Lord Jesus Christ. Pride does the unkindest thing of all. It blinds us to the humility of our Savior. Even when we're thinking about him, we're not really thinking about the right things. Our Savior really was the humblest person who ever lived. In a classic sermon by F.E. Marsh, Jesus is presented as a very opposite of pride in every aspect of his being. I never read words like this before. This is amazing. Number one, we take pride in our birth and rank, but it said of Jesus, is not this the carpenter's son? Matthew 13, 55. We take pride in wealth, but it said of Jesus, the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Matthew 8, 20. We take pride in our respectability, but it said of Jesus, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? John 1, 46. We take pride in our personal appearance, but said of Jesus, he hath no form nor comeliness. Isaiah 53, 2. We take pride in reputation, but it said of Jesus, behold a man gluttonous and a wine bibber a friend of publicans and sinners, Matthew eleven nineteen. We take pride in our education and degrees, but Jesus never went to any school, which caused others to remark, how knoweth this man letters, having never learned, John seven fifteen. We take pride in our position, but Jesus said, I am an among you as he that serveth, Luke twenty two twenty seven. We take pride in our resentment and ill will, but Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Luke 23, 34. That's why if you are seriously studying the life of Jesus and meditating on every aspect of his life, pride has no chance of starting. It's really something. The more we know the earthly humility of Jesus, the more we can fulfill Philippians 2, 5, which says, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. You know, there are Christians who know uh, Hollywood entertainers better than they know Jesus Christ. And so it's no surprise they're proud like them. There are Christians who know sports figures better than Christ. No wonder they're as proud as them. There are Christians who know politicians better than they know King Jesus. It's no wonder they're as proud as the politicians. We will absorb the mind of the person we admire. And if we admire anybody more than Jesus, then we will be just like that person. If you expose yourself to pride, it is the beginning of the end for you. The beginning of the end for you. If you expose yourself to humility, it is the beginning of a life of joy and blessing that will only get better and better. In closing, you need to make a decision. And here it is. First of all, to renounce all pride. Renounce it in its secret operations. Renounce it in its mental strongholds. Renounce it in its familiar habits. And then after you renounce it, do the second thing. Resist it. You must first declare war, renounce it. And secondly, you must fight, resist it. Sure, your pride didn't keep you out of church today, but your pride 
could keep you from praying at an old-fashioned altar. Your pride could blind you from your real need and thus getting the real answer, which is only a few steps away. Often God says, you, you, you move toward me, and I'll move toward you. Actually, invitations, probably their biggest value is this. God sees us moving toward him. And when you don't want to move, God says, fine. You don't want to move toward me, I won't move toward you. You won't draw nigh to me, I won't draw nigh to you. Often the reason no people don't pray is because of pride. You know what, if I go down there, they're going to think I'm a big sinner. Aren't you more worried about what God thinks of you than anybody else? Isn't it pride that says, I don't want anybody to think I'm a wicked sinner. You're a bigger sinner if you don't do what God leads you to do. Whatever you need, I believe the greatest need is to resist the pride that says, I don't need anything. The Laodicean church was the proudest of the seven churches, and they said this, we don't need a thing. And the Lord said, you need everything. You're naked, you're sick, you're blind, you're poor. You need everything. When pride says, I need nothing, you're the one who needs everything. And I like this too. That it's really true. If you resist God, he'll resist you. But if you yield to God, he will yield to you. Have you ever read this verse in James 4, 6? But he giveth more grace... Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. He resisteth the proud. Did you know that's said a second time in the New Testament? In 1 Peter 5, 5, here's what it says. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, and all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Isn't it funny that when you resist God, it's not long you're resisting your brothers and sisters. You resist helping them. You resist praying for them. You resist them. This resistance can't be stopped. It goes on to back away. But yielding, of course, to God leads to also brotherly love and wanting to yield to others. So those two references, James 4, 6 and 1 Peter 5, 5, they really talk about the same terrible loss caused by pride. You lose God's help, and you lose fellowship with the best people on the earth. Now, when you think about the loss of resisting God, I think about Hebrews 4.16. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain what? We need grace to help us in a time of need. Think of the consequence of not having enough grace. The more our pride grows, the less our grace grows. The more our grace grows, the less our pride grows. If grace is going up, pride is going down. Take the wisest and happiest course today. Resist pride by doing the very thing it hates. It hates bow to God. Pride is like Pharaoh who said, I will not let Israel go. I will not bow to these demands. And we know how his life ended. And so again, pride is that basic sin, and pride is the biggest sin, and pride is a blinding sin. And it's operating in this room right now. It's still basic, still big, still blinding. And so if you don't take care of your pride in the house of God, you'll just come in as you left, leave as you came, same pride. The only difference often is the decision that you make what to do with your pride. I'm here to tell you that if you will take the right steps, then you will conquer the greatest sin known to man. Pride is the greatest sin. It takes pride to resist God. It takes humility to yield to him. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes.